Welcome to the basics of probability. In this section we're going to look at uh, two kind of similar approaches to finding the probability of an event. And uh, what we want to learn mostly from this is some vocabulary and uh, how to interpret probability. So let's start with vocabulary. An event is any collection of outcomes for a particular question or experiment. Um, a simple event uh, is something that can't be uh, broken down into you know simpler steps or components and then your sample space is the entire collection of your events so uh, for example let's say uh, you were going to uh, roll one die right roll one die right half of a pair of dice an event would be something like um, say A would be uh, getting an odd roll, right? Um, a simple event is an outcome or an event that cannot be further broken down into simpler components. So your simple event would be you know rolling one, two, three, four, five, or six. And in fact, your sample space would be the collection of all of those. So that's uh, all the vocabulary means. Here's another example. So uh, the procedure or the experiment or the thing that's happening is, is giving birth to one child, right? Single birth. So an example of an event, which in this case is a simple event, is just having one girl. Because there's, you know, there's, you can't break that down into... Uh, smaller bits and pieces. And then the sample space for all possible ways that you could give birth to one child would be boy or girl. And then if we looked at it for three births, uh, a, a typical sample or example of an event would be two boys and one girl. And then you can see that if within that event are all the simple events of you know how it happens. Boy, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, and girl, boy, boy. And then the sample space is just the collection of all eight different ways you can have three kids. Okay, so those are your um, three kind of most important vocabulary words for this section. P always uh, denotes probability in this section. Later on, unfortunately, it's going to denote uh, proportions. A, B, and C are usually used to uh, denote the events. You know, so like A could be the event of uh, having three kids or you know specifically having two boys and a girl and then P of A would be the probability of having two boys and a girl and so as we saw from the previous example if we let A be um, you know have uh, two boys and one girl not necessarily in that order right just two boys and one girl then the probability of that happening well if we go back and Look, two boys and one girl happen one, two, three different ways, and there are eight total things in our sample space, so it's just simply going to be three out of eight, right? Or 0.375 or 37.5%. You can write these things, you can always write probabilities as a fraction, a decimal. Um, or a percentage, it's really dealer's choice. Here's the first basic rule for computing probability, and we've already seen it in my previous example, that it's just the number of times that your event A occurred divided by the total number of times the procedure was uh, repeated, or what I like to call just good over total, right? The, the good ways that the experiment could happen over the total number of ways the experiment could happen. Now, um, the book is going to try and show you that there's, you know, two or three different ways to compute probability, but it all just goes down to, to good over total. In this particular instance, they're trying to say that this is how you uh, figure out probability when you're actually running an experiment and observing the outcomes, right? But we just can't go around and force everybody to have three kids and then count up how many of them had two boys and a girl. So we normally simulate things. And this is kind of where the classical approach comes from, where we have some procedure with a certain number of simple events, in this case n, 
and each of those has an equal chance of occurring. So we say that it's just as likely to have boy, boy, boy as it is to have boy, boy, girl as it is to have girl, girl, boy, etc., etc., etc. And then we can figure out the probability of A happening just by the number of ways A can happen divided by the total number of ways that the overall procedure can happen. So again, it goes back to good over total. It's just now it's more of a theoretical thing rather than an observed thing. But it's all the same idea. So if we go back to the um, having children scenario, and uh, once again, here's our sample space. Right? These are the eight different ways you can have three kids. Assuming that boys and girls are equally likely, and that's a pretty easy assumption to make, right? they want to find the probability of getting three children of the same gender. Well, if you look up here at your sample space, there's three boys, there's three girls, and that's the only ones that satisfy the criterion right, of our event of having the same gender. So it's two out of eight, or we would reduce that to one-fourth or 0.25 or 25 percent. The law of large numbers tells us that if we um, a repeat a procedure or an experiment over and over and over and over and over again, the observed probabilities that we get will always tend towards and approach the actual uh, theoretical probability. And the example I like to give is if we flip a coin, what's the theoretical probability of it coming up heads? Well. 50 percent, right? One out of two. So in theory, if we flip a coin ten times, we would expect to see five heads and five tails. But we know that if we flip the coin ten times, we're not guaranteed to get five and five. We could get seven and three, or heck, we could get all ten tails. But the idea is if we now repeat that experiment ten times, a hundred times, a million times, because you really have nothing better to do than sit around and flip a coin all day, you'll see that the cumulative um, probabilities of those larger and larger and larger sample spaces of observed flips will tend towards the perfect 50-50, right? It'll get closer and closer to 50-50. And that's really what leads to gambler's fallacy and why people think they can sit at the roulette table and watch it come up black 10 times in a row and then bet a million dollars on red because they go, oh, it's got it even out. But the wheel doesn't know it was black 10 times in a row. So the next spin of the roulette wheel still has the same probability of coming up black versus red. Right? This law means that it evens out over a long span of time. It's not going to even out on the next spin. Right? There's a big difference between those two. So a simulation is just a procedure that we uh, use that produces the same probability distribution as the thing that we're trying to observe in real life. Like having kids. Right? We can't go around and just observe a bunch of people having kids but we know that having a boy or a girl is a 50-50 shot, so we can flip a coin. And then we can simulate uh, childbirth by flipping a coin, right? Every time it comes up heads, it's a boy, and every time it comes up tails, it's a girl, or vice versa. And so that's one way of simulating a real-world event. Okay, some of the basics of probability. Probabilities can always be expressed, as I said, as a fraction, a decimal, or a percentage. Um, normally, they're uh, displayed as decimals, and they're between the numbers of 0 and 1 inclusive, right? A probability of 0 means it's something that's impossible. A probability of 1 means something that is guaranteed to occur. And everything else is somewhere in between. So here's a nice little picture that talks about impossible, right? Unlikely, 50-50 likely. So again, a probability of 1 is something that's guaranteed, right? Certain, so like death and taxes. And then a probability of zero is impossible, like, oh, I don't know, me dating a supermodel because I'm not Leonardo DiCaprio. Everything else, somewhere in between. And in fact, in the uh, natural world, nature, uh, most things tend to oscillate around 50% uh, because there seems to be you know, two sides to every story, so to speak. There's birth, there's death, there's growth, there's decay. It's kind of the yin and yang of the thing. And in fact, uh, uh, using that idea and the idea that experimental probability will always um, approach theoretical. I read a paper a while back that uh, used that idea to posit that there needs to have something catastrophic has to happen in the near future to kill off a large portion of our population. And this is the argument they use. They said, so if you um, think about a probability of a half, if you go back in time, and start giving every single person a number. So all the people that have lived and died in the past all have a number and you continue on up and everybody who's alive today also has a number. So we all have numbers, both alive and both dead. In theory, if you were to pick somebody at random, 
right? Your choice and, and say what's the probability that person is alive. Well, the theory should be one out of two, right? It's good over total. Alive over alive or dead. You only have two choices. As much as I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer and things like that, there's no third choice. There's no undead. So in theory, somebody is either alive or dead. So the chances that they're alive today should be one half in theory. But in, in the experimental, in the practical world, we'd have to actually use the real numbers at hand. I.e., if we wanted to figure out the probability that somebody was alive today, we would have to put the number of people that are alive, right, over the number that are alive plus the number that are dead. Now human beings are nothing if not really good bookkeepers and we've got a pretty darn good idea of how many people are alive today. It's not perfect but it's close. Same thing we've got a pretty good idea of how many have ever lived and uh, died in the past. Again not perfect but pretty darn close. According to this individual's figures if uh, we were to do the practical version of this this probability would be greater than a half because the number that are alive is bigger than the number that are dead All right because if they were exactly the same it'd be exactly a half and if this gets bigger then the fraction gets bigger than a half and because we have a positive growth rate this number is actually approaching one and in fact we've seen these types of things in the past where we'll have a growth spurt right and then we'll have the black plague kill off a large portion of the population dump them all the dead category and now we're over here then we have a growth spurt and then we have world war one right growth spurt world war two and right now he's saying we're on a growth spurt something has to happen to dump them all in the dead category because we know that number should approach one half instead of one it's a lovely theory it's a beautiful theory and it has just one bad flaw and I'll I won't tell you what it is now. I'll tell you later in, in the video. I want you guys to think about what you think the uh, error in uh, his argument. But if nothing else, hopefully that um, helps you understand a little bit about the basics of probability. Okay, next we have a complement. A complement of an event is just um, the collection of all outcomes that don't satisfy uh, the original event A. So if we think of something as simple as um, A is going to be a rolling, right, an odd number on our six-sided die, then the complement of A is going to be everything else, which in this case are going to be all evens, right? So this is going to have the sample space of 1, 3, and 5, and of course this is going to have the sample space of 2, 4, and 6. It's just that simple. Now, obviously, the the uh, events can get more complicated, but the idea of a complement is still just everything that's not in the original event. So here's an example with uh, 1,010 adults were surveyed. 202 of them were smokers. So now the probability that somebody is a smoker is just good over total, right? 2 over 2 over 1010, or 0.2. Probability that somebody is not a smoker, which is the complement of that, is just one minus that probability, right? Because if if the complement is everything that is not in A, then it has to be all the others. And if we just did the math, we would see that if 202 of them smoked, then 1010 minus 202, right, gives you uh, what is that? Uh, 808 non-smokers. And then if we did 808 over 1010 we would get the 0.8. And you'll notice that uh, what happens when you add these two numbers together? What do you get? You get 1. And that's always the case. If you take the probability of an event and add the probability of its complement, you'll always get 1. And hopefully that makes sense, because remember, the complement is everything from your sample space that isn't already in A. So think of our odds and evens, right? You add those two together, that's all possible roles. So the probability of your complement plus, plus the probability of your event always add up to 1. Rounding off of probabilities, you really shouldn't round to the very end. And if you do have to round, round to four decimal places. We define an unlikely event as any event that has probability smaller than a certain number. And usually in statistics, that number is set to be 5% or 0 0.05. It can be set to other. Um, other common ones are 1%, 10%, and one tenth of one percent, but five percent is the most common um, designation for an unlikely number. Odds. 
um, are just another way of describing probability. You do not need to understand odds at all to be successful in statistics. So if these last four slides confuse you, you're lucky. It doesn't matter. Odds are really simply just another way of describing probability. It's kind of like you can describe a number as a fraction or a decimal. and It's the same thing. Odds is just another way of describing probability. So the odds against an event are always listed as a ratio A to B, right? Where A is, in this case, the probability of the event not happening, and um, B is the probability of the event actually happening. And then, of course, the odds in favor are just the opposite. So you guys have heard this before. You know, the odds of a certain team winning are 3 to 2, uh, or, you know, 1 to 5, or 7 to 10, or whatever it happens to be. That's how odds work. And so you can see since uh, A and B are just uh, uh, listings of probability of an event and probability of its complement, odds is just another way of listing probability. Payoff odds are different because uh, those give you uh, the net profit to the amount bet, and, and you know those only matter if you're actually betting. Here's an example. Bet $5 on the number 13 in roulette. Your probability of winning is 1 out of 38. Right? So that means you have 1 good number out of 38 total um, possible choices. And then the payoff odds are given as 35 to 1. So they want us to find the odds against the outcome of 13, and then what would our net profit be if we uh, were bet betting on 13. OK, so the odds against, as we saw from the uh, formula, is just the probability of not getting 13 uh, versus the probability of getting 13. The probability of not getting 13 is the 37 right, non-13 numbers out of the 38 versus the 1 out of 38. So it's 37 um, over 1, or we write it as 37 to 1. You'll remember that um, I told you probability is good over total. Look at how odds works, right? If we're talking about the, um, the odds of getting uh, 13, well, the odds of getting 13 would be 1 to 37, right? Because these were the odds against. And uh, look at what these numbers are. 1 over 38 and 37 over 38. Doesn't 1 represent all of the good ways that you can get 13? There's only 1, right? And then 37 represents all the bad things, right? Because those two numbers added together give you total. So if probability is good over um, total, odds is just good versus evil. It's the way I like to remember it, right? It's good versus bad. And those two numbers added together Right, the sum of them is the total. So that's how odds and probability are strongly related. Payoff odds is a totally different thing, and it really only matters, like I said, if you're going to be betting on the ponies or whatever. And uh, the idea is a 35 to 1 means you get a $35 profit for every $1 bet. So if you bet $5, you get 35 for each of those $1 bets, or 35 times 5, and you get a net profit of $75. You also get your $5 back, so you really, in essence, win $80. Your net was only $175 because you had to pay the 5 to, to play. Okay, that's probability. Welcome back to uh, The Secrets Will Be Revealed. Did you guess what was wrong with uh, this person's claim? It's a very common uh, example of another one of those bad statistics that I talked about in our um, you know, Why Bother with Statistics video. And it's uh, the idea that the number of people who are alive today is uh, bigger than the people who have, have died in the past. And it's very commonly um, uh, wrong, right? It's, it's a very commonly spouted and quoted uh, stat that is completely and totally wrong. In fact, if we go to the internet, we can see uh, quite a few links uh, to people asking, you know, if this is true or not. And the first link shows us that um, this particular factoid um, stretches all the way back has roots in the 1970s so it's been going around for a long time and it's uh, thoroughly and totally false that's it